Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as said, I'm the Chief Medical Officer for GE Healthcare um, in Europe. I'm a radiologist and uh, I keep my professorship at Hamburg University. And uh, so I regularly teach to try to stay up to date, my, but my responsibility is I'm um, overseeing um, medical, medical affairs, medical education, everything that has to do with medical for G Healthcare in Europe. Today it's about the future of artificial intelligence uh, in radiology, and let me start by just giving you a couple of numbers. The amount of data that is being generated in healthcare is um, simply mind-blowing. In 2010, it took three and a half years for medical data to double. Only 10 years later, in 2020, this year, it's only 0.2 years. This is 73 days, if you think about it. This is the time from now till Easter. So the medical data is doubled. That's, that's really incredible. There are 5,600 medical journals putting out 800,000 articles a year. There is more information in a mammogram than there is in the telephone book of New York, if there still, there still is a physical telephone book. And uh, um, if you think about it, a radiologist in a 12-hour shift is looking at 50,000 images. Only 15 years ago, these were like 500 images. So this is really a lot of data, um, uh, healthcare professionals, clinicians, radiologists, radiographers have to deal with. On the other hand, there are a lot of medical errors happening every year, 40 million. Of course, not every medical error is fatal, but it is estimated that if, you, if we take the numbers for Europe, up to 350,000 patients die every year due to medical errors that happened uh, in the hospital. To make this a little bit more tangible, 350,000 um, people, that's, uh, that's a city like Venice in Italy or Toulouse in, um, in France, gone every year. So this is really a big deal. On the other hand, we have a shortage of healthcare workers. Again, two numbers. This year, the global shortage is 7 million. And if we think in 2035, it is estimated there are 14 million people um, uh, missing, you know, lagging in healthcare. And this is due to the fact that a lot of staff is retiring and not enough young people, you know, moving into the profession or leaving for better paid jobs in the industry. So this is another big challenge. So I don't want to demotivate you, but this is like, uh, you know, um, the ramifications. This is what we are dealing with, right? And uh, so, and I always hear, you know, we need this um, disruptive technology now. And, uh, and uh, um, you, know, you know, what a surgeon needs least is a, is a, is a technology this, which disrupts him from his surgery, right? I mean, the best disruption is... Is, a, is, is an innovation that is non-disruptive, that is unfolding its magic in the background and, and not really, um, 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 you know, that is not, not apparent. It's, it's just inconspicuously working in the background. So, having said that, we really have to start doing things differently and we also have to stop doing things, quite frankly. We also have to stop doing things we used to do. And I don't know if you know that you share 99%, 99.5% of, of your DNA with a person sitting next to you. Just look at your neighbor. Probably hard to believe, 99.5% of your DNA is completely identical. So that means we differ in only 0.5% of our DNA. That's not much, right? But on the other hand, if you do the math, this translates into three million base pairs. And I don't think you need to be a professor of genetics to understand that a drug that I use to lower my cholesterol or my blood pressure, my high blood pressure, has a potential different effect in me than in you, in you, and in you. And why is that? Because we are so different. These 0.5% make the difference. This understanding is very important and paved the way from evidence-based medicine towards 
personalized medicine. We used to diagnose all the patients pretty much in the same way, and then the therapy was the same. Now we are going to a more individualized approach for diagnosing patients, and also we have tailored therapies. Let me just give you one simple example of where we are applying personalized medicine for many years in clinical routine. This is a, um, you know, the topic is breast cancer. You know that probably 15 to 20 percent of all breast cancers are so-called Herceptin positive breast cancers. The problem with those kind of breast cancers is they are very aggressive and the prognosis is, is rather poor. On the other hand, um, uh, there is some light at the end of the tunnel because there is a monoclonal antibody, it's called trastuzumab, Herceptin, um, which really helps those patients to extend their life. The problem is, or the challenge, that this drug comes with some side effects, including cardiac toxicity. So you want to be sure that you only give trastuzumab to those patients that are Herceptin 2 positive, because otherwise, if you give it to every patient with newly diagnosed breast cancer, those patients only get the side effects and there is no effect. So that means that in every patient with breast cancer, a so-called molecular um, um, analysis is done to really look if this patient is Herceptin positive. And of course, only in those patients Herceptin is given. Very easy example of personalized medicine. So, in personalized medicine, we are moving away, you know, from this generalized approach, one size fits all, more to a tailored, individualized approach in healthcare. Or, you could say, we are moving, you know, from a philosophy where, you know, every patient is diagnosed the same way to really a tailored therapy, not for each individual patient, but probably for sub-cohorts of patients. And if you look at personalized medicine, there are basically three buckets. There is the diagnostic bucket, there is the therapeutic bucket, and then there is the monitoring part. We are dealing with traditional radiology data, in vivo data, and then we have all these kinds of omics data, in vitro data, coming from lab, from pathology, from your wearables, from the EMR. Just one remark uh, uh, regarding wearables. I don't know who, who, who has a wearable or has a Fitbit or something. People who have a, have a wearable usually don't need it because they are athletic anyway. I mean, the wearable was invented as an option for athletes, and now we have to translate or transform this into a medical device. I mean, the 80-year-old patient with a BMI of 35 sitting on the couch the entire day eating chocolate, this patient probably is in need, uh, is in need of a wearable, or probably it's too late in, in this kind of patient. But it's, it's interesting what is happening with this wearable market. And when we are talking about the explosion of data, and you've heard about it, we are talking about exponential growth compared to linear growth. And let me just give you a quick example that I think nicely illustrates what exponential growth really means. Just assume I have a step length of one meter to make it easier. So in a linear, <coughs> in linear growth, if I walk 30 steps, I have walked 30 meters if my step length is one meter. So, in an exponential growth, if my starting step length is one meter, I have walked 26 times around the globe after 30 steps. It's really incredible, it's mind-blowing, and just, I want you to keep this in mind um, when someone talks about, you know, exponential growth, sometimes they show these graphs, they go up, and you think, wow, this is really, they really go up, but, I mean, 30 excursions, 26 times around the globe. So, how can we deal with this avalanche of data, the poor radiographer, the poor radiologist, dealing with all these kinds of data? 
So now AI, artificial intelligence, is coming into the game. And before I talk a little bit about AI, let me just ask this question, and probably it's a little, it's a little frightening. Will AI become humans' last um, intervention, uh, last invention? Because, you know, from that time on, everything that is going to be invented will be co-invented by AI, probably, if, if you think about it. And as you know, we are surrounded by AI in our daily lives. Who is using AI? We are all using AI. At least everyone who has a smartphone, I guess that's the vast majority of the people here, uses AI every day. Just a couple of examples. Every time we do a Google search and click on one of the suggested links, we are part of machine learning. And Google takes our click as an indication that you know, the results proposed were pretty good, otherwise we wouldn't have clicked on them. And uh, is using, um, you know, all this feedback to make the, the search and the search results better. Other examples include Netflix, for example, every Friday I get an email what to watch based on what I have watched. There are other examples, if you use Siri, Uber, and also an example from GE Healthcare, um, uh, from our aviation um, um, colleagues. We are using uh, artificial intelligence for predictive maintenance in jet engines. The airlines really love that. For every engine that is actually sitting on a plane, there is a digital twin, a so-called digital twin on our computer systems. And as you can imagine, a jet engine generates a lot of data in real time. And this is sent to our computer systems. And then we can really go away from this maintenance after a thousand hours or 2,000 hours of operation more towards a flexible maintenance uh, approach. And of course, there are lots of cost savings that can be generated. And it makes complete sense. Um, if our computers indicate it makes sense to do some maintenance tonight, the airlines can avoid technical issues, technical failures, um, with the need to rebook patients and, and uh, cancel flights and stuff like that. And we have integrated this approach into healthcare. So now let's take a look. When we talk about artificial intelligence and imaging analytics in healthcare, where can we apply um, um, AI? I see three different levels. There is the individual level. And what I mean by that is that we are implementing AI capabilities right into our scanners, into our CT systems, into our MR scanner, into our ultrasound scanner. Then there is the departmental level. This is operational AI. We use AI to streamline workflows in radiology departments, in private practices. And then we have the so-called enterprise level. And enterprise level means we can use AI um, to look at patient flow in entire hospitals or even hospital networks. I will come to that later. Let's start with the individual level. As I said, we can implement AI right into our machines. And I would like to give you an example from X-ray. You know that a condition hospitals fear is, especially on the ICU, is a pneumothorax, a collapsed lung. And you also know, if not diagnosed correctly and in time, it can be potentially deadly. And if you think about the situation, it's three o'clock in the morning, um, and, uh, the technician is performing um, an X-ray uh, with a mobile X-ray system on the ICU, the radiologist is probably in the emergency room or is reviewing some CT cases. So the tech is doing the images, the chest x-ray, and no one is looking at those images. And research has shown it takes up to eight hours till a radiologist actually looks at, at this x-ray. And what we have now implemented on, on a mobile x-ray system is implemented AI capabilities. So the technician is doing the X-ray on the ICU and the implemented AI 
in an alert system with a traffic light, you know, green, yellow, red, is, is really highlighting critical cases. So that means the tech can see, oh, it's very likely that this patient has a collapsed lung and then can send these images to the PEC system with high priority so that the radiologist can directly look at those images. And what I like about this example, um, it's not the case whether the AI outperforms the radiologist or the radiologist is still better than the AI. It's just a hybrid model, you know? The radiologist and the AI are working together and the AI is is just highlighting potential critical cases. This is a very nice example. Uh, we have introduced the system um, over a year ago and this resonates very well um, with, with our clinician because if you ask them, um, diagnosing a pneumothorax um, is, is, is really continues to be a clinical pain point. I mean, if you look at the image, it's not that difficult to diagnose a pneumothorax. I mean, there, there, are, there are tricky cases where there are subtle pneumothorax, but it's just about highlighting out of those 10 images, look at these two first, because it's very likely those patients have a pneumothorax. So, you know the Prince, Prince of Wales, and if you look at that image, well, is the Prince of Wales really showing the finger to the reporters? Probably not. You know, as a radiologist, you always need the second, the lateral view. And, and this was just outside Kensington Hospital, um, um, you know, when um, his wife gave birth to their third child and he was just illustrating to the reporters, you know, now I have three, three kids at home. Why do I show this? The best radiologist will miss the diagnosis or will do the wrong diagnosis if wrong images are highlighted. So that means we really have to pay attention that the algorithm is validated and is capable of, of really highlighting the, the critical images and not some images um, you know, that, that look fine. Um, in the end, it's the radiologist who is signing, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, by signing the report saying that I have really reviewed the images. But you know it, um, nowadays you can generate a thousand images in 10 seconds and probably a radiologist cannot, cannot review all those thousand images. So we are having AI uh, to highlight critical cases. So this is very important um, um, that, that we know or that we really have to take care that algorithms that we are developing with our partners are really capable of, of really highlighting the, the, the critical um, uh, image series. So the second part is the departmental level. And as I said, we can use AI to make workflows better in private practices, in, in hospitals, in radiology departments. And this is just one example from a private practice in Germany, in the Frankfurt area. Um, uh, there is a, a customer of us, um, he owns nine or 10 imaging centers in the Frankfurt area. And the waiting time um, to get an MR for his patient was too long. At least he thought it was too long, it was six weeks. You know, if I give this presentation in the UK, they would love it. It's only six weeks waiting time. For him, this was unacceptable. So the first thing we did, we optimized the imaging protocols, and this is very important, without sacrificing the image quality. So we were able to reduce scan times by 16% and keep, keep the good image quality. And then, you know, together with Dr. Alas, that's our customer, we, we looked at, um, um, you know, the scheduling system, um, we looked at the um, um, radiology, at the risk system, and we could actually, you know, optimize processes here. So in the end, we could drive down waiting times from six to two weeks. And a nice side effect, of course, if you can scan more patients, especially if you're in private practice, you can, of course, generate more revenue. This is an example of how we can use 
AI. We call this brilliant radiology, imaging insights in radiology departments. And the final level where we can use AI is the hospital level, or I say it, the network level. And uh, we call this command center. This looks like a NASA control room, but it's not. This is inside a hospital. And we are using, you know, predictive analytics to manage patient flow, to manage patient experience in emergency departments and on the ICU. This is an example from the UK, from Bradford, where we recently opened a command center. We call this command center. Uh, we have more than 10 command centers in the US up and running. I remember when I was a resident um, um, in radiology, I did one year of internal medicine. And, and so I, I was in the emergency department. And again, it's in the middle of the night and you have to find a bed for a patient. So we used to call the first ward and the nurse would tell you, sorry, we are full. You would call the second ward. And it was really tough to find a bed. Now you have full transparency. You can see where are, where are available beds, where are clean beds. Um, and, and then you can really optimize um, 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 you know, the usage of, of bats. And you can translate this. There is data from the US that you can add virtual bats just by better using clean or available bats. So this is a very interesting concept. It's called command center and hospitals and really, really like this to really manage patient flow in the hospital. So now I would like to come to a very important um, uh, point. Uh, GE is a big company. So GE has like 300,000 people working for, for, for GE. GE Healthcare has like more than 50,000 employees. But if you do the math, the majority of people is outside GE. So also the majority of smart people is outside GE. So we need partnerships. We are looking for partnerships worldwide to develop applications. And also we need partners to tell us if, if the things we are so excited about that we develop are really clinically useful. Sometimes our engineers are so enthusiastic, they think they have developed something great, but in the end there, there is no need, right? For it. That is why we need partnership partnerships and we need the user experience we need we need the partners worldwide and with regard to the application development we are looking for data partnerships um, in Europe also in the US of course but more and more also in Europe and there is not one partner for the entire field of application development so we have a partner where we develop this pneumothorax app together this was UCSF we have another partner um, and where we are looking for MR of the heart and how to apply AI there so very specifically for certain indications we are looking for partnerships so if you think of the future and the impact of digitization on, on future jobs, so sometimes I'm asking myself, so what does it need to thrive and to survive and to have a good career in the future? We all know about the IQ, you know, the intelligence quotient, and we also know about EQ, emotional uh, intelligence, but there is a new term that I would like to introduce to you, and this is... TQ. TQ is the technology quotient, meaning how open are you, how, how open are you to embrace new technologies? Or are you more like the person, I've done it the, th the last 30 years like this, I will not change. Of course, probably not everything that is going to be developed in the end turns out to be useful, but the technology quotient really shows your ability to adapt to, to the digitization that is happening around you. And if you look at future jobs, 
I mean, on the one hand, we know that in the coming years, every second job will probably be gone due to digitization. On the other hand, there will be new jobs coming, which we probably don't have a clue right now what these jobs will look like. But if you think, you know, of the of the medical, um, um, you know, area, uh, you can think we would need health data analyst. We would probably need someone who guides us through this jungle of all the data. We will probably have you know, prevention specialists who really use data and uh, try to do predictive analytics. So there are a lot of probably jobs emerging and I'm sure there will be. And uh, I mentioned Google earlier. I did a Google search and um, I typed in AI will replace. And there you can see, um, the, you know, the, the, the answers that Google gave me, jobs, doctors, humans, lawyers, okay, and then also radiologists. I'm biased, I'm a radiologist myself, so let's ask the question, will AI mean the end of doctors? And if you think about what a doctor or especially a radiologist is doing, I think it's a complete, you know, misunderstanding of what radiologists are doing. We do much more than just looking at images. Just think of the exciting field and growing field of interventional radiology, where you really work with the patient. And within the field of interventional radiology, interventional oncology, it's the fastest growing field um, in, in radiology. Or, for example, radiologists, they sit in tumor boards. They discuss cases with other colleagues. These are all tasks, I think, um, that are not easy um, uh, you know, to, to being taken over by um, AI. On the other hand, I think it's clear AI can do a lot of great things. Just think of repetitive tasks or, quite frankly, boring tasks, measuring you know, um, lesions in the lung, 30 uh, known lung metastases. If AI can do the job, it's great because it frees up some time for the radiologist to look at more sophisticated cases or to actually also talk to the patient. So, I firmly believe that, you know, when, when we look at this, that AI is there. It's not science fiction, it's science fact. We have to deal with it. But I think um, it offers a tremendous opportunity um, if we use AI to make a better diagnosis, to make a faster diagnosis. On the other hand, think, think, think of it. You know, would you like to sit in a plane without a pilot? The autopilot has not replaced the human pilot, but has augmented the capabilities of the pilot. At almost every airport, for sure in Europe, you can automatically take off and land, you know, um, with an autopilot. But, I mean, come on, who would like to sit in a plane without, without a pilot? I, I like this analogy because the radiologist, of course, is still, is still needed. And as I said... AI per se will not replace the radiologist. But what I also say and firmly believe is that radiologists who do not embrace this technology in the end will, re will be replaced by those, by those who do. So, let me summarize. Artificial intelligence is really here and it is here to stay. It will not go away. Love it or hate it, it will not go away. I think it, it really can help us to see more, to diagnose disease faster with a higher accuracy, and it will really help to re-establish a human connection between the patient and the doctor. So it will help um, really to humanize, to humanize um, ra ra radiology. So in the end, my suggestion would be to responsibly embrace AI and not fear it. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.